Why is it so hard to trust? A few years ago, I went on uh, to a, a week-long conference, and part of it, uh, one of our activities was to go to a ropes course, an outdoor ropes course in the Redwoods down in California. And we had to do all kinds of daring, crazy things. And one of the things they had us do was just to sort of uh, work on, confront our, our fear of heights, but also learn to trust the team. And so uh, one of the things they had me do was I had to climb up this pole and stand on the top. It's like standing on the top of a telephone pole. And it was not stable. It was moving crazy like that. I was harnessed in, and my team was holding on. So, you know, it, it, it should be safe, but I did not trust. <laughs> I did not trust them, did not trust the harness. And it took me a long time to take a flying leap. But I finally did, took that flying leap, jumped off the pole, and reached for that trapeze bar. And my team did hold me. I did not die. I'm happy to report the picture does not quite, it, it's kind of a good promo picture, but I didn't make it. I, did, I didn't. I was just, just short of that bar. But my team held me up, and uh, whether or not I trusted, they were there. They didn't change. Like, the, the ropes held, the team held. Why is it so hard to trust God to supply your needs? Just like it was hard for me to jump off that tree you know, I'll take a flying leap. Why, why, why is it so hard to trust God? As Christians, we say that we trust God for everything. We trust him to supply. We trust him to take care of us, to provide, to show us where to go, what to do. We say we trust him, but our actions often show that we really trust ourselves. We trust our ingenuity, our strategies, our finances. If I've got a good bank account or I've got a good network, then I'm okay to take a risk. But really, we, we say we trust God for everything, but we don't always act like it. And that's why we're in this little mini-series as a sub-series from the Sermon on the Mount, little mini-series called Mine, Not Mine. And one of the things that we're trusting God with is our finances and our material possessions and just everything that we call mine. Because we, we know that everything comes from God. So it's mine, but it's not mine. It's really God's. And he lets us steward it and manage it and take care of it. Would you turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 6? And we're going to be starting in verse 25. It's verse 25 to 34. We generally read from the NLT translation. So if you've got a Bible app, like the U version app, you can just select that, and then you'll, you'll be uh, heading right along with us. So let's, 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 uh, let's give you just a little bit of context. Previously on the Sermon on the Mount, <laughs> Jesus talked about trusting using three illustrations, and we talked about this last week. Number one was your treasure. And we learned that if you really trust God, you will live as if treasures in heaven really matter. The second illustration Jesus used in Sermon on the Mount was your eye. Your treasure, your eye, your eye. If your perspective is distorted by materialism, consumerism, then you become blinded to God's truth. You become deceived. And the third illustration was your master. You, you cannot serve both God and the spirit of money and collecting things. It's the spirit of mammon, or sometimes just abbreviated, the spirit of money. And if you try to do that, if you try to be fully devoted to God and fully devoted to the things of this world, then it, when you allow something else into God's place in your life, you become an idolater. You become someone who is worshiping something other than God, e even if it's something in addition to God. We, we don't want to be in that boat. And so Jesus is calling us out of that. Now, now, as we move into today's passage, let's consider whom Jesus was talking to, the audience, the crowd, all right? So he's talking to people who had the capacity to store up treasures on earth, Okay, so when Jesus said, hey, don't just store up treasures on earth, store them up in heaven, he was talking to people who could store up treasures on earth, all right? They were people who had at least ordinary means, access to jobs, access to finances, access to a network of friends and family. Uh, and so, so then Jesus addressed that treasure. 
The, Jesus' audience was people who have the opportunity to have a begrudging or stingy eye towards others. We talked about that last week. Jesus said, if your eye is not healthy, your whole body is in darkness. Your whole self is in darkness. So the, the people Jesus was talking to had the capacity, the ability, the opportunity to be stingy. Okay, so are you, getting a, are you starting to get form a picture of who he might be talking to? He was talking to people who could be enslaved to the spirit of mammon, accumulation of things. So Jesus is not talking to those with no means. He is not talking to the desperate, destitute, the down and outers, the people who don't know where their next meal is coming, coming from. But the, the tenor of this, when, when Jesus is saying, hey, store up treasures in heaven, not just on earth, the, the tenor kind of sounds like Jesus is talking to people who are just struggling. But it seems like he's not. He's not just addressing the poor who are going through like a famine in the land and saying, buck up, you know, just... Keep trusting God more. That, that's not really who he's talking to. He is talking to you and me. That's who he's talking to. So we cannot just relegate this to like, well, this, this Sermon on the Mount or this passage, it must be for someone else. It must be for the struggling. No, he's not talking to the struggling. He has different things to say to the struggling. In, like in Matthew chapter 25, where it's written down, he addresses the solution for the poor. What we're talking about today is not the solution for the poor. In Matthew 25, do you know what the solution is? God's people provide. That's the solution. He, he, Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me, you, my followers. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was naked and you gave me clothing. That's a different discussion. The people who have nothing. And Jesus says, I got a plan for that. We're going to help you. That's what the kingdom of God does. That's what the kingdom of God is. So here, I just want us, I really want us to get this. He is talking to you and to me. This is for you and for me. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's for us. So he is discipling people with the means, the people who have the means for living generously. And Jesus expects us to do so. That is, what, that is who he's talking to. He's speaking to people who had jobs. They were farmers. They had um, businesses. They sold uh, clothing or wh whatever. He's talking to those kinds of people, not necessarily the rich, but people who had the means to come and travel and hear him, things like that. That's who he's talking to. So then we pick up today's passage. So let's remember, this is flowing out of last week's passage, all right? Matthew 6, 25. Jesus says, that is why, okay, we got to stop right there already. In other translations, it's translated, therefore, or because of that. So whenever that happens in the Bible, it's a transition that is connecting what just happened or what was just taught with what's coming up. And so that's, I want to just make sure you, you get it. So he just said, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Then he says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you will have enough food and drink or clothes to wear. No, worry is about the future, all right? So Jesus is saying, don't be all caught up in your future. Even people with means can be very focused on just, uh, I got to make sure this continues. I got to make sure I'm strong. I got to make sure the, you know, the accounts are, are good. I got to make sure that I'm earning interest and all that stuff. So when I, I, before we go on, he says, don't worry a bunch of times in this passage. Don't worry about everyday things. And this word, this root word for worry, it can be used negatively or positively depending on the context. It's, it's the, word, the, the word that sort of means like cares. All right? So in a negative context, when, like in something like this where Jesus is saying, do not do not worry. It means stress-filled effort to obtain the things you need. Jesus said, don't do that. Isn't that great that he would say that? And he's going to talk a little bit about why. So let's listen in this passage for the many reasons Jesus gives us to not worry, to not do that. So he goes on and he says in middle of verse 25, isn't life more than food? Isn't there more to life than just that? Isn't there something higher than just what you're going to eat tomorrow? 
And isn't your body more than clothing? Like, isn't it just so great to have life and health and just one outfit? Like, that's, that's a positive thing. That's a good thing. Your body's more than just the many variety of things you, you dress it with. Verse 26, Jesus says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than him, than they are, to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Or some translations say a single inch to your height. Verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. Okay, so now he did not say, look at the pruned roses at the palace. He's saying, look at those weed flowers that are just growing out there, the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon, this is one of the kings of Israel, Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. So Jesus is saying, your heavenly father is lavishly generous on wildflowers. Lily's out in the field, just growing in the ditch, growing in the field. He is lavish, and he dresses them beautifully. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. That is a Bible promise spoken from the mouth of Jesus himself. He will certainly care for you. So when you pray, you're not praying, Lord, whoo, I hope you want to take care of me. That's not what we're praying. We're, saying, we're praying, Lord, your word declares you will certainly take care of me. So, Lord, I call on you to honor your word in my life. Do you see how that affects your prayers? It's, it's big. It's huge. He says, if God takes care of the wildflowers, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Now, that's interesting. So we need to context. Uh, everything that he's saying in this little passage we're going through today ha- relates to your faith in God. And Jesus is saying, if you're so worried, then why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Don't be like that. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Okay, now, so in Jesus' day, in Israel, if you say to a Jewish person, you're thinking like a Gentile. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Them's fighting words. People, like, for us, we just kind of gloss over that. Oh, yeah, snore. No, in that, that day, they were like, smack. What? Thinking like a Gentile if you're worried about your everyday needs. And Jesus would specifically have had in mind the Gentiles nearby. The, a Gentile is a non-Jewish person. All right? So though he would have had in mind those people. And I, I did not really, it didn't really dawn on me until I was studying for this message that there were wealthy, affluent Roman cities nearby, like Sephora and Tiberias, where it was wine, women's song, theater, luxury, velvet. So there were people around them they, that they could see the, this, this mindset in people, this, uh, this Gentile thinking. So again, Jesus is not talking about to people who don't know where their next meal is coming from, but he is denouncing our tendency to focus on getting material things to the exclusion of focusing on God. So this is for you and me. This, this, this is for us today. Okay, so Jesus said these things, what will we eat, what will we wear? That's what dom- dominates the thought of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. That is a Bible promise from Jesus. Another translation says, make your top priority God's kingdom and his way of life. Yeah. 
So again, I, I bet every one of us in this room, uh, and, and probably many online also, would say, oh yeah, totally, God, top priority, done deal, I seek the kingdom of God above everything. That's what we say, but do our actions look like that? Do my actions look like that, that I seek the kingdom of God above all else? Because that is the condition of the promise. And sometimes in the Bible, a promise is tied to a condition. There is a prereq, a prerequisite. And he, he gives us one here. And he wraps up this whole long passage, verse 34. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And this is kind of a, this is a unique verse in the kingdom or in the Sermon on the Mount, which is all about the kingdom of God. Where Jesus kind of, he, he's not just saying all these lofty, he, he does, he said a bunch of lofty things. Your heavenly father provides, cares, lavishes. And then at the end he just goes, listen, there's enough worry tomorrow, which you just don't worry about tomorrow. Let's just, let's just be content and just take care of today's business. Like, wow. So kind of unique there. So were you listening? Were you taking notes? Did you, how many reasons did you find for, that Jesus said in this passage why you're to not worry. There's a, there was a bunch. I'll just, I'll just summarize them for you. Uh, one reason, it's more beneficial to seek the kingdom of God than to stress over the cares of life. It's more beneficial. There's more benefit to seeking the kingdom of God than to stressing over the cares of life. Another, another reason, God is gracious. He is generous. He is caring. He lavishes his care. He takes care of, care of birds and flowers and... You are more valuable than they are. He takes great care of them, but you're even more valuable. You're made in his image. Another reason he gives, worrying is ineffective in the long term. It doesn't add an inch to your height. It doesn't add a moment to your life. Worrying is ineffective. It's, so he says, so don't do it. It's, it's, not, it's not getting you anywhere. It's not get, moving you forward. In fact... Worrying may do the opposite to your height and the length of your days. Isn't that interesting? We worry trying to prolong our life, and worry shortens your life. Wow. A, a final reason that he gives, unbelievers focus on things. Jesus followers focus on the kingdom of God. And when you do, God takes care of you. There was something hanging on the wall in my grandparents' house when I was growing up. And I always used to go and look at it. Had a little dial and a movable marker. It was a barometer. And I don't think we talk much about barometers anymore, but it used to be kind of a common thing to hang on the wall. There would be a, like a, 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 a What's the temperature gauge? Therm thermometer? A thermometer? All of a sudden, wait a minute, thermostat? No, uh, thermocoupler. Uh, and, and then right below it, a barometer. A barometer m measures atmospheric pressure. All right? So uh, it has a couple different functions. The one I knew about, if the, if the atmospheric pressure is changing, that means the weather is changing. All right, and if it, if it goes up, it's more likely to rain. If it goes down, it's more likely dry. I believe that's the way it goes. Uh, but it's, if, if it's changing, if the atmosphere is changing, the weather is likely to change. That's one of the ways they predict the weather. Another type of barometer is an altimeter. It tells an airplane pilot how high, how, what's their altitude, how high off the ground are they because the, the atmospheric pressure changes. So they can use that same technology to kind of predict the change of the weather and also predict how high or low you are off the ground. So Jesus is saying your anxiety level is a barometer. Your anxiety level is registering the weight on you and the weight that you put on God or on things. Just like a barometer measures the atmospheric weight, the, the weight, the heaviness of the atmosphere against you, he, the, your anxiety, your worry level is like a barometer, and it is showing you just how, what you're trusting on, what you're relying on, 
how much weight you're putting on your stressful efforts to obtain what you need. So to be fair, this passage today, probably uh, everyone's in a different place when, it, when you hear Jesus say, do not worry. Uh, you probably uh, fall, fall somewhere on the spectrum between worrywart Walter and carefree Karen. And I don't know which one you are. If you're a worrywart, it may even kind of hurt your feelings that Jesus says over and over again, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry about things and about your everyday life. But Jesus is trying to shift your focus off of your own ability your own stress out ability to provide and on to your father's ability and care. Now, if you're carefree Karen or carefree Clint, uh, it may not hurt to be a little bit concerned about your life. Don't just recklessly throw everything away. Still be a good steward of the things that God has given you. Jesus doesn't mind challenging your mindset. Whichever end of the spectrum you're on, he rhetorically asks, can't you see how God provides for birds and flowers? Where is your faith? And I love it because you could take that a couple different ways. In where is your faith and where is it? It's missing. <laughs> Either way, it kind of kind of it works. If I could summarize this message in this passage in one way, it would be like this. If you focus on God's business, he'll take care of your business. If you take care of, of, of God's business, if you focus on it, if you obsess about God's business, the kingdom of God, he'll take care of your business. So what is God's business? What is the kingdom of God? Well, we can find a couple of, of hints or clues just from Jesus, uh, from what Jesus did and what he sent his followers out to do. First of all, 12 and then 70 or 72, and then all believers that would come. He sent us out and he did, uh, went out declaring the nearness of God. So actually saying to people, there, God is real, he is near, he cares. Uh, kingdom business, God's business, is inviting people to repent or turn away from their sin. It is healing the sick. It is delivering the oppressed. That is God's business. It's what Jesus did. It's what he sent his disciples out to do. But then in Matthew 25, it's another long teaching of Jesus. And, and he, he describes in a little bit more detail the kingdom of heaven. He, it, it, it is staying full of God's spirit. And he, he told a little parable about people with lamps, and you got to keep them full of oil. And he, uh, one of the what part of God's business is you and I staying full of the Holy Spirit. It is bringing God a return on investment, whether He gave you one talent, two, or five. It is taking those resources of whatever it is, your wisdom, your finances, your house, your job, what, taking those and bringing God a return on investment. It is feeding and clothing those in need. Jesus is pretty harsh. In Matthew 25, he goes, you fed me? Come here. You didn't feed me? Bye-bye. Yikes. I mean, yikes. Like, wow. That's kingdom business. It is taking in the outcast. I did a little study on stranger. Jesus said, I was a stranger. You took me in. I was like, what does that mean? Just someone I haven't met? No, it means the foreigner, the person who does not belong is a stranger. So taking in the outcast is kingdom business. Caring for the sick, visiting the prisoner. That's just, that's just a teeny snapshot of what God's business is, of what the kingdom of God is. And Jesus said, you focus on that, and my Father will focus on providing for your future. We've got to take the whole Bible together. Proverbs talks about laying in store, working in the summer, laying up for retirement, all that stuff. So that's absolutely good and right. But we're talking today about focus. We're talking about stress and worry and anxiety. And Jesus says, do not worry about your life. Trust God instead. And he doesn't even just say trust God. He says, focus on God's business and God will take care of your business. That's what he says. So Jesus is not being legalistic. 
He is not heaping on you a bunch of commandments or rules or to-dos to do. In fact, throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount, he's been saying, it's the heart, it's the heart, it's the heart, it's the heart. It's not just yelling at someone. If, you're, if, you're, if inside you're mad, it's like you've murdered them. You want them dead. Like It's the heart. It's the heart. And Jesus says, in your heart, do not worry. In your heart, Seek the kingdom of God. Seek God's business, and he will take care of your business. Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. So the kingdom of God is that place where you're living in salvation and freedom that Jesus provided through his death and resurrection, and where you're living in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the kingdom of God. And to live righteously means doing God's will. It's living righteously. It's doing what he wants. That is what happens in the kingdom of God. And it's revealed in the word, in the Bible, and in Jesus' life. And doing God's will is a natural outflow of seeking God's heart. So it's not like you have to stress over all the rules. Oh, I got to feed the sick. No, just seek God's heart. And when you see sick, do what comes naturally. Because if you got God's heart in you, you're just going to naturally provide and help, right? The promise is, and he will give you everything you need. He will. That's the promise. I, I want to just share some encouraging scriptures as I, as I wind down today. Jer- Jeremiah 29, 11, God is speaking to a people that he had punished. And he says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And even if you go through discipline or hard times, that's not God's desire. His desire is to bless you. And sometimes he takes you through something really hard. But his desire for you, his plans for you are good, for hope, for future, for prosperity, not disaster. Psalm 37, 3 to 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. See that heart thing and that outworking thing. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. It's really good news. It's a very good news. And then finally, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 and 9 and 10. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. And I, I just had this moment again. It's, it's, it's a weird kind of a deja vu thing that happens to me when I, when I look in the Old Testament and then I hear the words of Jesus and I realize Jesus wrote it through the Holy Spirit. God wrote the Bible. Jesus is the Son of God. And he is almost like just drawing out little things that we might have missed in the Bible or in the Old Testament and saying, hey, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. And it just sounds exactly like this. Commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him, and he will help you. I love it. Verse 9, verse 6, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain, and your vats will overflow with good wine. God is generous. He loves you. He cares about you. And he invites you to come and be a part of his kingdom. And it's a good place. It's a good kingdom. It's a place where you have significance. You have, a, you have something to contribute uh, through helping others, through giving, through serving, all those different ways. And it's a place where God wants to bless you. God wants to provide for you, care for you, encourage you, prosper you. That's God's plan. So if you focus on God's business, he'll take care of yours. If you've given God your presence, your future's in his hands. Amen? Your future's in his hands. Would you stand with me if you're in the room? And online, would you just get to a place of prayer? Maybe just uh, set down your knitting for just a moment. Uh, put down the keyboard. And let's just pray, all right? Would you bow your heads with me? And let's pray. Jesus, I just thank you for your kingdom. It's so weird. Many things seem upside down to our world, but I guess the issue is that our world is weird. 
Lord, I thank you for the new normal, for the kingdom of God normal. And Lord, I just say, come, kingdom of God. Be done, will of God, in my life, in our congregation, in our city, in our region, in our nation, in our world. Come, kingdom of God, to our world, because our world would be so much better if everyone were following you, Lord. There'd be enough to eat. There'd be no war. There would be peace. There'd be getting along. There'd be love. Oh, Lord, may your kingdom come soon. And, Lord, help us to seek your kingdom above all else. Above all else. Not just in what we say, but help us to actually live that out today. Starting today, an hour after this service lets out. May your kingdom come in us. May we seek your will, what you want. For those of us going to a restaurant today, Lord, I pray that we'd be loving to the server and to the host, and to anybody else we see. For us going to work tomorrow, I pray that we would show your love, that we would seek your kingdom from our desk, from our shop, wherever we are. With your heads so bowed, I want to ask you just to consider prayerfully, if worry is a barometer, what's your level of worry telling you about your focus and your trust. If worry is a barometer, what's your worry level telling you about what you're seeking above all? Would you prayerfully consider how much of God's business did you focus on this past week and realize you have a fresh week in front of you? How much of God's business will you focus on this coming week, today, tomorrow, the next day? Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Jesus, you cared enough to, to encourage us. I thank you, Father, that you provide for us. Help us, Lord. Help us not to worry. Help us to obey your command. Help us to not worry about what, uh, what next week's going to bring. Help us to focus instead on your business. Help us, Lord. And staying in this attitude of prayer, I want to give you one invitation. I don't know if you've already put your faith in Jesus, but right now we're all praying for you if you haven't. And I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. We're all born into sin, so we all need a Savior. Jesus paid the price with his life for your sins. And now he asks you to put your faith in him, in his work. And I want to invite you to enter the kingdom of God and be Jesus' apprentice. Whether you're watching live or here in the room or you're even watching this later, God is in real time. And you can pray to God right now. Turn from your sins. Turn your life over to God and let him lead. That's how you enter the kingdom of God. And I just so want you to be part of the kingdom of God. If, if today you're in the room or online and you'd like to make this decision to put your faith in Jesus, would you just raise your hand so I know who's making the decision today? And I want to just lead you in a prayer. And online, you can raise your hand to God even though I can't see you right now. God can. Yes. I want to coach you in a prayer. Would you just all pray after me? And we're just going to, we're going to support those that are praying this prayer. But you pray this prayer to God. Would you pray, Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we just want to welcome you to the kingdom of God. Yes. And I would love to just be able to encourage you and to, to know of your decision. If you made that decision today, would you text the word RESTART? to that phone number 97000 and just give me enough info, contact info to be able to get back to you because I want to say here's what to do next, all right? I, don't leave me hanging, all right? So let's text, let's move forward and follow Jesus. Amen. Yeah, awesome. And while you have your phone out, yeah, awesome. We are encouraged, amen. We're going to be focused on Jesus this week and on his things. 
let's pay attention to what his business is. Um, while you have your phones out, I want to invite you also, if you have not connected with us, to text the word GREET to 97000. Now, here's the deal. When you do that, it's going to give you also an option to give us your email. And I had mentioned earlier in the service that if you would like to have an email with all those upcoming events, that's how you will be able to hear from us. So if you want to go ahead and, and do that, if you haven't been getting emails from us in the past, be sure and do that, and we will be able to connect with you. If you're joining us online, would you please subscribe to our YouTube channel, and that just lets people know who we are and where to find us. And the next week, remember what next week is? Father's Day! So we will see you here 1030, and special treats for everyone next week. God bless. Have a fantastic week.